the first and only father and son team to be executed by the state of Iowa, Philip and William Heansey. Iowa has had a long history with capital punishment, stretching over more than 100 years, from the earliest days of settlement in the 1830s. To 1965 when the death penalty was repealed. 46 men were executed. There were no women. Philip and William Heancy established several firsts when they were hanged on the same scaffold at the Iowa State Penitentiary in Fort Madison. They were the first and only father and son team to be executed by the state of Iowa. And Philip at 72, was the oldest. But it was the two men's ignorance, their dim-wittedness, that also must have set some kind of record. Together, they had lived well over 100 years on the planet yet they had remained sublimely ignorant of the world around them. Philip, the father of William, testified that he had gone to school off and on through the second grade, that he couldn't write couldn't read, had never placed a long-distance telephone call, didn't know the significance of Easter, nor the number of months in a year, nor the number of days in a week, nor anything special about the 4th of July, except that I have to work every 4th of July. For his part, William, testified he was born on Christmas Day 1900 but never knew the significance of that day, nor Easter nor the 4th of July. He said he had attended school for parts of four years. Their defense attorney, K.B. Welty, summed up his client's plight. These men came into this world with very limited capacities, never attending Sunday school or church except for a few times, and school was limited and society in which they traveled was limited and opportunities were limited because their intelligence did not permit them to get into proper society. But that isolation didn't prevent them from becoming ruthless criminals, and, in the end, murderers. Philip didn't enter prison until he was 51, which suggests, as their Catholic priest on death row observed, that son Bill apparently is the dominant personality and the father seems to follow his lead. The two were Missourians and, in 1924, were arrested for the first time for stealing a Ford Touring car and escaping from jail. Philip got seven years in a Missouri prison, his son William got four years. After their release, they headed north into Iowa and in 1931, near Iowa Falls, they held up a couple at gunpoint, kidnapped them and stole their car. About two weeks later, they shot it out with Mason City Police and were apprehended. They were convicted under the false names they gave P.H. Smith for Philip, W.H. Baker for William and sentenced to a maximum of 25 years at the Iowa State Penitentiary. Philip Heancy was paroled after nine years, his son William got out after about ten years. In 1944, they were back together and ready to attack again. On the evening of December 14, 1944, William and his dad boarded a train out of Quincy, bound for Spirit Lake in northern Iowa. During an earlier spring dad had worked for a short time on a farm near Spirit Lake, while William had helped out at a nearby resort, on West Lake Okaboji, run by Robert and Esther Rabel, a prominent, deeply religious, childless couple who were known for the hours they spent with the children of the Spirit Lake Methodist Church. The Heancys would later claim they had headed to northern Iowa to retrieve a car they had stored there and to make some money hiring out to pick corn. Dickinson County Attorney W.B. Battle never believed them. He maintained their only reason for coming to Spirit Lake was to steal and murder. Bettle cross-examined Philip, 
getting him to admit that he didn't know where the car was, that he and his son carried no luggage with them, no extra clothes, no work gloves, but that they did bring along a gun and a billy club. You didn't expect to pick corn with a billy and a gun, did you? Betel asked. After arriving in Spirit Lake, William said in his confession, they loitered around the railroad depot for a few hours, undecided about what to do next. They went to a tavern and had a beer, then ate a sack of donuts. Then, almost by chance and with apparently little forethought, the two said in their confessions they decided to walk the four and one half miles to the Rabel Resort planning to rob the couple of the large amounts of money they believed they had on hand. William and his dad said they watched through a resort window as the Rabels ate supper, washed the dishes, and moved into the living room, where Esther addressed Christmas cards at the card table. When Robert got up to go down the basement to check the furnace, the he and she struck, breaking into the resort. William, who was carrying both the 22 caliber revolver and the billy club, shot Robert just as he was coming back up the stairs. He staggered into the living room and fell on the floor, almost at his wife's feet. The bullet entered his neck below the right ear and severed his aorta, causing him to bleed to death. From Esther, the he and she's demanded money and the car. She gave them all the money she had, about $28 and the car keys. Before fleeing, William slugged the woman several times over the head with the billy club, knocking her unconscious to the floor. In their confessions, the he and she said they believed they had killed both the Rabels, but, within about two hours, Mrs. Rabel had recovered enough to call the Okoboji telephone operator who spread the alarm. Mrs. Rabel was also able to identify her assailants. The Rabel's car was found the next day abandoned in downtown Storm Lake. Nineteen days later, the Heancys were arrested without incident in Quincy. They were returned to Iowa, quickly confessed, pleaded guilty and awaited sentencing from Judge Fred M. Hudson. The Heancys hoped to escape the death penalty by arguing that they intended only to rob the Rabels, not kill them, that Robert's death was unintentional. But Judge Hudson was unpersuaded. If robbery was all they intended, he asked rhetorically at their sentencing hearing, why did they not stop there? The facts of these cases warrant the finding that these defendants completed their robbery and then in order to make good their escape and avoid detection and identification, purposely inflicted what they thought were fatal injuries upon both the victims of their robbery, and killed one victim and thought they had killed the other. In so doing they thought they had eliminated the only two persons who knew them and who could identify them as the robbers. The judge said he also tried to determine whether one of the Heancys was more guilty than the other. The younger man apparently did the shooting and most if not all of the beating, Judge Hudson said. However, the older man planned the robbery with him entered upon the perpetration of it armed and knowing the younger man was armed and in what manner, demanded and received the money of at least part of it, handed the billy to the young man to use. How can it be said under our law that both are not equally guilty and responsible? William and his dad were sentenced to be hanged on March 29, 1946. The effort to spare the lives of the Heancys focused on Governor Robert Blue, not the Iowa Supreme Court, because the Heancys attorney, K.B. Welty, did not believe his clients had been treated unfairly in the court process. They did a grand job, he told the governor. 
The appeal to Governor Blue didn't come to a head until March 4, 1946. Only 25 days before the scheduled executions, and it raised arguments about the mental acuity of the Hiedsees. Actually, Welty told the governor, these men are poor, wretched, depraved souls and, although you may feel there is no value of them to society, I say to your honor, we should not hang them. As you well know, we have institutions all over this country where we keep our mentally defective and crippled people. Welty suggested that if the HNC defense had had the money to hire psychiatrists, possibly and probably a different result could have been obtained. Welty also blamed society for allowing the HNC's freedom in the first place. Perhaps they should have been kept in the penitentiary long ago and I presume that society has laxed in not seeing to it. But the governor bored in on the question of the Hiancy's insanity. Asking Welty whether the Dickinson County judge had heard any testimony about it. No, your honor, Welty their lawyer responded. You didn't call any local doctors that would have any knowledge of psychiatry? The governor asked. No, sir, Welty responded. Did you raise that question with the court? The governor continued. No, sir, Welty answered. Do you feel they know the difference between right and wrong? The governor asked. Yes, sir, at times, but I think there are times in their lives that they were so crazed that they lost control of themselves, Welty responded. Any feeling on your part that they are insane, or are they uneducated persons who lack self-control? The governor asked. In respect to the elder he in I have sensed that he is rather unbalanced, Welty responded. I think the younger fellow is not that bad. The governor didn't delay in announcing his decision. Their whole history has disclosed that they were at war with society, Governor Blue said. I can find in statements made to me no reason for granting executive clemency. But Welty battled on. Only days before the scheduled execution, he asked for a sanity hearing. Arguing that Philip Hiancy had the mentality of an eight-year-old boy, Welty said, We certainly would not hang an eight-year-old boy in this state. I can't believe that the great state of Iowa, on the eve of its 100th birthday, will bloody its hands by taking lives in this manner. The time will come when this state will follow other intelligent states and do away with executions. Welty was partially successful. The Iowa Board of Control ordered an immediate sanity examination of the Hiancies. Two psychiatrists and a psychologist questioned the two men for more than two hours on the Wednesday before they were scheduled to be hanged. Their conclusion? Neither of the Hiancies was insane nor feebly minded. The hangings went off as scheduled. Philip and William, on the night before their executions, got baths, shaves and haircuts, and the prison made suits, hats, shoes and ties. The traps were sprung by Dickinson County Sheriff John McQuirk at 6.01 a.m. William dropped a split second before his dad. Philip was pronounced dead after 11 minutes, William after 12. Thank you for watching Death Row. Today's video is sponsored by Nobility.co.uk The leading company in selling legal titles in the United Kingdom. Get a 10% discount in any purchase by mentioning Death Row. Here in the UK, there are two types of titles. Firstly, there are peerages, which are granted by the Queen. 
These are not allowed to be sold. Secondly, there are manorial feudal titles. Uh, these were once based on land ownership. Uh, however, since 1925, titles have been separate from the land itself with the introduction of the Law of Property Act 1925. Here is the UK government website showing what titles are legal. Manorial feudal titles are regarded as inheritable property, which any nationality worldwide can purchase. Companies selling seated titles or titles with tiny plots of land whilst sounding good are in fact by law novelty souvenirs, not real genuine titles. Legally approved by UK trading standards, barristers and a UK law lord, no other company has a law lord ruling, 100% legal and proper. You can add your title to passports, bank cards, etc. Even American and Canadian citizens can add the title to their passports on the observation page. All UK and foreign titles have passed 12 legal security checks before offering them for sale. Buy with confidence from the number one title broker in the world, established 1996. Compliant with Privacy Data Protection Act 2018, the Honours Prevention and Abuses Act and Law of Property Act 1925. All processed through UK solicitors. Strictly private and confidential.